So originally I was going to do like a talk about um, kind of how to segue from classical pen testing into uh, industrial control systems and specializing in industrial control systems. But I'm going to go over one of the software-defined radio tools that I've been developing and things along those lines. So um, it's basically, yeah, it's it's an amazing industry to get into and it feels like the early 2000s. Uh, how many people in here are pen testers or do pen testing for a living? And then how many people are in like IT positions for companies that are ship systems or anything along those lines? Yeah. So, like, either of those are, like, segue points, and I was going to kind of go into how, because I, I started out, you know, doing classical pen testing, or actually started doing a terrible job, which is uh, server migrations, and then I was scripting and doing t two to three times as much as everybody else, so it's something where, you know, you segue into actual pen testing, and then from doing classical pen testing and exploit development and uh, into actual industrial control systems, and one of the, the biggest things is, like, the... It's just weird because it, it feels like, you know, uh, the Windows XP days, like when you used to go pen testing and some people wouldn't even have, you know, patches uh, fully aligned and things along those lines and uh, just very, very easy exploits to pull off and things along those lines. So, but yeah. And a little bit about me. So, um, a majority of the oil rigs and uh, cruise liners and, you know, uh, actual uh, ship systems I've done and aircraft systems and things along those lines have all been for a company called uh, MSI or Mission Secure. And uh, a little bit about myself, I'm uh, 33 years old, I've been doing pen testing, I live in North Dakota, and uh, it's nice and cold up there, I've spoken at DEF CON, uh, main track talks, uh, 20, 22, 3, 4, 5, uh, 27, uh, this is uh, the village talk I'm doing this year, so I've done uh, Black Hat, uh, Hardware I.O., ICS Security, uh, Enterprise, yeah, just tons of speaking event. I've done over 60 speaking engagements, so, and yeah, uh, 15 years of pen testing, um, uh, more than that, about 18 years of programming, so, and hacking ATMs, point of sale systems, um, everything IoT. Um, eventually, got, I originally got into actual industrial control systems by reverse engineering some malware that was going after oil rigs, and uh, they were actually stealing uh, drill stem testing information so they could tell if the well was productive before the actual people who drilled it, which is kind of crazy. So, And yeah, going into hacking oil tankers and uh, just pass, uh, passenger vessel aircraft systems, so a lot of the AR, INC 429 and some of the, uh, the specifics about it. And that's one of the things I love about it. Like, if you get burned out on actual classical pen testing, you can get into some of the actual offshore rigs and, uh, yeah, so... And I'm going to go over a little bit of the actual pen testing as a profession, and then that level of skills, how to transition, because um, you wouldn't believe how much, um, you know, it's kind of like a game of World of Warcraft, like where you specialize in something. So if somebody's a web app guy, or they're known as a web app guy, or SQL, or uh, just uh, certain people go into exploit development, things along those lines. Uh, how to actually segue into that a little bit, I'm going to go over some of the tools I developed, because there's literally no tools for it. You can't just go buy Metasploit for, you know, a Caterpillar engine diagnostic system. You literally have to listen to it, find out what the hell it's saying, and then uh, try to say something back to it, or see what it does in post, like when it's doing its power on self-testing and things along those lines. So, And yeah, I'm going to go into the actual uh, protocols and equipment uh, research and exploit development. So, um, you know, some of the more advanced uh, exploits and things like that, if you can get unsigned code to run on a similar device, sometimes uh, there's a trust between um, things along those lines. So, yeah, and just looking at the actual attack surface of... Um, the yeah, and automating the actual testing of it because it's um, as fun as it sounds. Like you know, going to Brazil or in the middle of the ocean several times a year is not <laughs> not all it's cracked up to be. So it's something where uh, yeah, I'm going to go over some of the like the ways that you can actually segue into the actual um, testing purposes. So. Yeah, and uh, different kinds of pen testing. Like I said, there's classical uh, hacking. That's what everybody, you know, they, like when a bank or a hospital gets a pen test. And uh, there's web, mobile, and app uh, application testing. And then um, this is the usual progression. Somebody, you know, plays around with a lab or, you know, hacks their friends on I I ICQ or something like that. You know, then it leads into, you know, actual uh, web app, mobile testing, and then most likely into physical testing. And then uh, then you get specialized. You you get your final spec. And uh, that's, I'm going to use a couple outdated World of Warcraft analogies, but that's pretty much the only easy way to explain it. So, and I highly recommend if you guys have any questions at all, feel feel free to reach out to me, and I will like go over in four hours <laughs> just some of the how to you know actually do the attack surface of a ship. It's very easy to do like a you know server 2012 or whatever, and like some of that does tie into this. Um, like people always ask like how to get into pen testing. That's like one of the biggest like when I would talk to college students and stuff, and it's like you have to start out with some of the systems administration stuff. You need to know what a lazy sysadmin does because you're going to eventually have to exploit it. And with some of the networking. Um, like some of the recent uh, really, really crazy ones where you can, you know, get in from a guest network and be on a ship like, you know, 12 hours later or something. Um, a lot of that requires networking. It requires uh, device exploitation and things along those lines that you do learn from a life of actually doing uh, 
just normal penetration testing. And then physical stuff, um, you know, everything I use in my house, my internet of things, I always do, do my own physical pen testing. So, like, I pen tested my ring system, just, you know, tore bot second system and just rent, tore it all apart. And, uh, yeah, there's a couple other IoT devices that uh, I've uh, torn apart and things along those lines. But I've done a lot of uh, uh, vehicle control area networks, so I was uh, specializing in that a little bit before. So, But I always recommend it, especially when people get burned out, if they're in an overhead position or you aren't billable. Um, it's something where you have tons of time to do research and things along those lines. You can specialize in this. And I just would, if anybody has any questions at all about that, that's that literally hit me up on Twitter, and I will uh, take the time to go through some of the attack surface and how to build that up. So. And it's at a tipping point for maturity. It literally feels like 2002, 2003. Uh, every single month. Uh, and sometimes there are operating systems running from those years. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the funny parts of it. But uh, so looking at the actual uh, wireless attack surface, and I'm going to get into some of the automation. And like even on airtight systems, they're using a wireless keyboard that's exploitable, or they'll use you know something at a specific uh, down the road. And it wouldn't you wouldn't believe if you know the resolution of a screen, and you can actually you know connect a device, you can start uh, clicking things. So and uh, it's a pretty interesting group of concepts and um, automating it, like I was saying, is uh, like one of the main purposes that I was developing the wireless tools for it. So. But yeah, web application testing. So all the HMIs, a uh, majority of them are web-based. Um, some of them um, have gotten a lot better about locking things down, and um, there's certain uh, systems where you can actually get the get uh, their hardened system. So there's an HMI in a control room or something like that. I've actually, you know, tapped on the command prompt, went to the info button, and then got it to pop up an Internet Explorer browser, visited a local device on that network, ran an Internet Explorer exploit. Oh, it's like that's a chain of attacks that you have to do to, you know, actually execute some of that stuff. So it's something where if you can get something local on the network, uh, you know, that's that's one finding right there. There's another finding, second finding. And it's more above and beyond just writing reports. It's about actually taking that attack surface, like understanding how some of the whitelisting and some of the other pen testing I've done in the past, it's something where, you know, if you're able to do um, cell site emulation legally, like where you can, you know, spoof onto a network, sometimes you can hit a four-year-old Cisco device that's unpatched and, you know, things along those lines, and you can get past uh, access controls and things like that. So it's definitely something where taking into consideration your uh, previous experience with pen testing, you can definitely get into ship systems. And it's amazing how many ship systems systems have uh, operating systems running on them, so, or just normal off-the-shelf operating systems. So. And yeah, classical pen testing. So uh, to stay on top of all the exploits, you know, there's all the named ones nowadays. Oh, that is your phone. I was like, what happened to my phone? I th <laughs> Anyways. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, but uh, basically going into the actual remote code execution, exploit development, um, understanding how the exploits work, because a lot of the sh uh, systems, they try to lock them down or harden them. So it's something that uh, looking into, like I have, I did several years of ATM pen testing uh, before I got into some of the more industrial control systems, and it's something that, uh, yeah, it's just uh, taking a look and an approach at how people try to harden things, and a majority is through security through obscurity. So taking into consideration classical pen testing, um, you definitely need to develop those skills. You definitely need to uh, uh, pull those um, exploits off on the boxes also. So and the IoT and smart smart stuff uh, is basically. Yeah, just uh, doing man in the middles on phones. I've done several uh, CVEs. I think I have uh, 22 or 23 under my belt. Uh, some of them are internally disclosed. Um, a lot of them are with um, uh, cell phone manufacturers and things along those lines. And uh, some of those have just been found by tinkering with, uh, you know, doing a web map test on a phone. And then all of a sudden you see, you know, some sort of traffic that you're not supposed to. So, and yeah, it's, um, I definitely recommend uh, getting as many devices as you can and understanding how they work. And uh, so start digging into attack surface of them. Because uh, once you have that analytical thought process where you can go through and see exactly how these systems interact with each other and how they prefer certain interfaces. So what happens when a cellular interface goes down or when a device is inside of a room that they assume can't connect to the internet, but it still has a cellular interface on it. It's still looking for cellular towers. That's an attack surface that you're able to detect um, with um, the right wireless equipment. You can see the beaconing information. And you can actually, since you're in international water, you don't have to have a 50-foot Faraday cage. You have to pull it all off. And so it's really, really fun stuff. And uh, I highly recommend... Uh, yeah, get, getting into uh, tractor systems, car systems, uh, definitely go over to the, all the villages around here, guys. There's a wealth of information. These people are amazing. And uh, like most people are uh, pretty approachable. So it's uh, definitely a good industry to reach out on. So. And if you're not confused, you're not learning. Uh, that's what I've learned over the years. I got a, there was one year where I didn't like learn anything, and I just used like the exact same stuff over and over and over. And uh, if you guys ever get that, you get this, uh, this learning curve that you have to work through uh, once you get back to actually trying to learn things. So if you want to start you know, getting into like vehicle systems, like uh, I was doing some autonomous vehicle stuff. And I had to read the RFC for 802.11p, and then you know, find out what wave communication vehicle to infrastructure stuff is. So there's all these things out there that aren't your classical pen testing, and you'll feel like an 11-year-old when you're doing it. So that's the thing I can recommend for you guys is go out and buy like an $11 PAL tuner, uh, burn it out. <laughs> 
and then find out why it burned out, and then you know get like the actual. Um, you can work into some of the Scotts gadgets for the SDRs, and some of them aren't technically software-defined radios, but uh, you're able to listen to different frequencies and spectrums. Like a lot of the uh, software-defined radio automation I'm doing, I literally have. Uh, so it's a Scott Hack RF, and then I have a. Edis N210 with a specific daughter board. So I'm going to actually have like a, a, a smaller radio is looking for frequencies. It's going to be looking for just broad spectrum. So it's a spectrum analyzer that basically looks all what's talking over a day period and then it'll pass off and then it'll capture huge spectrums of that. And it's all uh, all about automating it because it is expensive to fly people out to a ship in the, or you know shipyard in the middle of nowhere and things like that so it's something where especially if you know there's light plant switch at you know midnight every night it's you know some people don't want to be up at those hours or they don't want to send technicians out there so that's why i'm kind of working on um automating it and uh going through the process of it so it'll basically do everything that i do on a pen test it'll tell me if there's pager traffic and then if there is pager traffic the next day it'll listen to that pager traffic it'll sample it and then you know um, you can actually go further with that you can port um, some of it's just raw serial communication when you actually break down the actual uh, communication of it. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, talk to people in the industry. It's amazing. Like when I wanted to get into oil field hacking, like I did, uh, so I was reverse engineering the malware. It was uh, geared at oil rigs in the Balkan. That's where I'm from, up in North Dakota. And I just went to a bar and just chatted with like a bunch of MWD, which is like measure wall drilling people and directional drillers. And it's amazing, you know, like they have a you know dirty. You know, uh, fire resi- or fire resistant gear, and you just chat them up a little bit, and people love talking about their jobs, and that's definitely something I recommend. And especially if you have the opportunity to be in an overhead position, just try to learn as much as you can if you know wanting to get into some kind of consulting basis. So, and yeah, like I said, uh, you can't be a master at everything unless if you literally uh, dedicate your entire life to it. Like, you, you know, you you guys all know that one friend that you go to with like the Linux questions and stuff like that. Yeah, there are some people that do dedicate. And, uh, but you need to specialize in uh, four or five fields and then just become a master in those. And uh, like uh, for three years, I did telecom stuff. And then I went on to other stuff. And then I've ended up using my telecom stuff uh, for base station hacking with uh, site to site. You know, like these rigs, they'll have a site, site to site. And if you can actually, you know, have an actual CPE or customer premise equipment, you can pop up in between there and, oh, they're not using hardware encryption or they are using hardware encryption, but there's some kind of spectrum you can listen to there. So, and there's always a lot of uh, information you can do um, just by learning how those actual systems work. So, and yeah, levels of skills, uh, be enough. Okay, there's uh, several levels of it. And what I recommend for people is be good enough to sell it or quote it on everything like be able to you know talk about WAFs and you know and I'm not saying become a salesperson I would never recommend that to anybody but it's definitely something enough to self study is the next step uh, enough to hack enough to script and then enough to uh, make exploits and uh enough to actually research and reverse engineer. So just work your way through those uh, levels. And like I was saying, this is pretty much an untouched industry. I would say it's five years mature right now, which is, you know, literally puts us in the early 2000s. So for as far as um, opening up, uh, if you guys, anyone want to segue into that kind of industry or if you're in that kind of industry and they don't let you touch those systems, if you can throw some of the lingo around enough to quote it type situation, they might actually allow you to have access to some of those systems and then hopefully not brick them. But yeah, so you can play around with them and learn them because some of these systems are, you know, a $400,000 propulsion system. You can't just buy that on eBay. So. And yeah, having a broad skills is always positive. Um, being able to know at least, you know, what the device is trying to do um, is the level that you want to get to for all of it. And then you can kind of go over the actual attack surface of the vessels themselves. And when you get married or have kids, uh, your time does go away. And uh, there's this uh, stopping point like when you turn 28. So, like, uh, mentally, after 28, it becomes impossible to <laughs> pick up on new stuff. So, so for all the 30-year-olds in the room, it's, uh, I think you guys, you know, are above, you kind of feel that. It's kind of hard to, uh, to learn things or pick them up as fast as you used to be able to. So, but, uh, yeah. And uh, also, yeah, just getting into the actual uh, software-defined radios, like I said, is the biggest thing. Um, uh, I started... Uh, tinkering with them, you know, just bought a PAL tuner, and then I ended up um, uh, doing some uh, work with the university, and we ended up buying like four of the best uh, USRPs, the Edison 210s, and then I ended up uh, doing a, a mid- man in the middle attack on a, a Jeep key, like actually starting a Jeep a quarter mile away from its key, and I did uh, responsible disclosures with K- uh, um, uh, Fiat Chrysler, and like just, you know, just starting from the bottom and, you know, like moving up and just wondering how stuff works and curiosity. And for a while there, I was, I was getting bored. I was like, uh, you know, how many times can you get domain admin in four hours or, you know, like some, it just becomes a little bit repetitious. And it's really, really nice to be able to mix these kind of things into the mix. So, 
And background and transition, like I said, um, you need to have um, pretty much all these skills. And all these skills are really good to work into. Um, if you are like a me mechanic or a technician, as long as you have analytical thought, they make some of the best people for actually doing this kind of stuff. So, And uh, yeah, actual student perspective, uh, yeah, like I said, you're young, learn everything you can. And uh, listen to as many videos as you can on double speed. And uh, yeah, and uh, programming is a must uh, at a certain point. You're going to hit some kind of wall. That's something I always like to go through with people. Uh, you don't necessarily need to be able to program, but you need, like, uh, you know, you can't really modify a Metasploit payload if you don't know Ruby or if you can't, uh, you know, come up with a proof of concept if you can't modify the Python. So. Yeah, it's definitely something to look into. So, and then from a pen tester's perspective is the way that I went. So I went through uh, networking into pen testing, and then I backfilled all my systems administration stuff. So I definitely recommend learning a little bit about everything and then getting specialized into the actual ship, ship systems. And like I said, the exact same way you look at the attack surface and want to learn this stuff, you have to look at the sales materials first. Because like when I was doing aircraft hacking, uh, what, what does an aircraft use? And then you look at like people who are selling aircraft stuff and they're just bragging about how their product does this, this, and the other thing. Then you read a couple RFCs and then pretty much you're at the point where you can at least talk the talk and then you start actually diving into some of the actual testing and things along those lines. So, And yeah, overhead versus consulting. Like I said, um, uh, an overhead position, you're not billable. That's just what I mean by that. Um, I would recommend that. It's something where you have tons of free time to be able to learn things. Uh, they'll pay for training, things along those lines. So, And then consulting, uh, if you're young, and want to travel a lot, that's definitely a, a good field to get into. So, and yeah, and some of them are, um, there's trap positions to watch out for, like where they'll promise one thing and then it's another thing. So uh, just have your eyes out for that kind of stuff. But if it's something where you want to uh, work into one of those positions from the current position you're in, that's why I kind of asked how many people were in actual pen, or in pen testing or consider themselves uh, even doing light um, exploit, you know, testing or stage one exploit testing. If you run, running scanners and then proving that they're working and stuff like that. So you can still segue into one of these fields. And like I said, this is one of the growth industries. If you have the background knowledge, you'll be able to yeah, definitely get um, positions in this. So. But how to learn all this? Um, yeah, practically every machine is a root, you know, has some kind of operating system running on it. So just understand how expo exploits work. Uh, I can't stress enough, and you guys can tell by how fast I talk. I listen to everything on double speed. So, and uh, setting up a lab and understanding the exploits. Um, old phones, car parts, like literally everything you have. I, I, everything I get, I desolder it. Like even if it's some weird thing I bought at a rummage sale that I don't know what it does, I'll Google everything that's on it. I don't have as much time to do that anymore, but I like knowing what every single uh, piece of a device does because I do a lot of hardware hacking. And uh, like when I used to do a lot of cell phone exploitation, you had to actually pull everything off the chip. Everything has gotten a little bit more uh, advanced nowadays, but it's definitely something still worth checking into. So, And like I said, um, being able to program um, is really, really nice because you can take somebody's GitHub project that they you know, forgot about while they're going to college, and then you can basically uh, turn it into something else, which is an actual tool. Um, like I said, it's a, I, I call it like a weaponized spectrum analyzer, which is basically going through um, all those frequencies and just being able to, you know, not burn out the radios and understanding how radios work and actually tinkering with software-defined radios. I can't stress enough how much, it, how, how young you feel, like just playing around with those radios. I feel like, you know, when I tore my dad's VCR apart when I was little or something, you know, it's like that kind of enjoyment. So I can't stress that enough. And yeah, getting uh, as many devices as you can, setting up the labs. Um, reverse engineering, uh, started out cracking video games uh, back when I was in junior high. That's how I got into C++ and assembly level languages. So it's something where if it's, you can take one of your loves and uh, integrate it into another one. And if you guys want to get into heavy duty programming, I recommend at least programming an hour a day and uh, do all the languages you hate or the really hard ones. And uh, it's like playing Resident Evil on really, really hard and then going back on easy and you just breeze through it. So uh, using video game analogies. But that's what I like to do. I like to confuse the crap out of myself. And one of my bosses, he used to call it Inmidius Reese, which means he liked to throw me in the middle of things and then have me like uh, learn both ways. And it's if you, when you uh, learn the hardest stuff you can where you're hardly confusing yourself, uh, all the other stuff just comes naturally because you're Googling this, that, and the other thing. And once you're going over the actual attack surface of a ship or uh, a boat or anything along those lines, like some of the cruise liners I've done, like I remember, you know, uh, it, just being able to find the specific system of those systems and not having internet is like, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, I'll Google in front of a customer. It doesn't scare me. You know, some people are like, I'm a know-it-all. I never, you know, Google. But no, I'll Google stuff. But sometimes you can't Google stuff. And you need to uh, know at least the basics of everything. Like some of the encrypted traffic I did on one of my first ship systems, I basically was sniffing out a lot of this industrial space uh, wireless spectrum. And I was like, I have no idea what this is. And then I got it home, it was encrypted. But I was able to repeat it and be able to see that it was, you know, speaking some of the preambles and stuff like that. So to know that it was a legitimate ship system. So... And yeah, like I said, the walls, uh, people who can't program, uh, like, that's something I, I thought I couldn't program because they tried to, you know, I got this uh, Visual Basic book and it was 
you know, make a calculator. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so what I did was I got a bunch of C code and I just literally read it, confused myself. And then I started uh, programming at least an hour a day. And like I said, uh, even if you're confusing yourself and you're literally just reading for that hour a day, do it. As, uh, you will run into a wall. And it's not as hard as you think once you've actually been in it. Like you'll, it's a, like that thing that you've done for three years that you can't realize how hard it was at one time. That's exactly what programming is. And uh, if you don't feel like you don't like programming, it's something that you learned it the wrong way. Or there's so many teaching methods, especially in universities now, um, where they're teaching it uh, what I would consider the wrong way. So, and yeah, people who uh, stagnate at one company I've seen, or or there's the opposite of that: the guy who hops in between companies every two years when their renewal bonus is up, or you know things along those lines. So, and yeah. And that's a good way to burn out HDMI. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. And like I'm saying, I'm don't don't feel bad googling things. Uh, Google as much as you can. Um, yeah. And fear. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As, as far as work face, anti OS. Like some people are like, I'm never going to do anything with this, that, or the other uh, operating systems. And some of the real time operating systems are really, really dry. And a lot of them are repetitive. And there are some recent exploits and things along those lines. So staying on top of those exploits, in addition to a 40 hour work week, which none of us probably have, it's all, you know, more hours than that. But I spend at least eight hours researching exploits, looking on GitHub, uh, finding out how things work. And if I don't understand them, I have to find the mechanics behind the other thing. And it's, it's amazing, like when you can. You know, uh, basically, you know, like I, I could talk some crazy, <laughs> crazy things you can pull off, but it's like chaining together six or seven things, and some of them don't seem to be big things. You know what I mean? Like if you can deactivate a Windows license, what does that do? It's like I know the next time that machine boots up, what page it's going to try to go to, and if I'm in a man in the middle, I can basically run a, a server by or a web browser exploit. So there's lots of cool ways to do sandbox escapes from hardened systems like that, be it an H HD or you know HMI or some other system like that. So, and we are running out of time, so. Yeah, just uh, I think I have one more slide here. So yeah, this custom space um, for custom software find radios. Uh, get into the uh, get into their untouched uh, wireless findings. Like I, I can't believe how many people don't. Like if you guys are classical pen testers, at least start doing this. Start uh, looking at how many Bluetooth. There's Bluetooth wireless, um, a hack, uh, crazy RF radio things been out since like 2016. So there's no excuse for not knowing that there's wireless keyboards. And if you can literally sniff out people's passwords, you can, and I've done that in the wild. Like I've uh, done that, I've done that before. I've paired with devices and then done keystroke injection. And sometimes it's good enough just showing them the proof of concept on that. Like even if they're one of those customers, you're, you know, they, they, they have a really hardened surface. You might not be able to get in exactly. You might be able to actually uh, sh still show them that there's weaknesses with some of the wireless keyboards and things like that. So yeah, and as far as that spec uh, uh, spectrum tool I have, like. Yeah, I got two minutes left. So, but I'm going to go into a little bit about the actual device itself, and uh, yeah, so it basically has three radio antennas. So it has Edison 210, has a Scott, uh, Scott, and has a Crazy RF on it. So basically, um, scans for Bluetooth traffic, and then I have an Ubertooth one on there also. But so if you want to start getting into heavier payload sampling and things like that, or if you want to start deauthing stuff or doing two-way communication, you can. Um, but it basically is a way to automate some of the wireless testing. So because like some, if some people do pen testing, they like to send a box on site and things like that. And I think it would make a really great addition um, to on, on site pen testing. Like how many hospitals uh, have people pen tested and they don't realize their pager traffic is unencrypted and they're leaking PII information. Like it's, it's amazing. Like room numbers and a name or room numbers and a kind of medication. You know, then you can literally say, you know, it's so and so. It's 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 an amazing uh, thing to be able to add to the deliverables. I don't want to get all project managery, but <laughs> it's definitely something that uh, people will enjoy, and I think your customers will enjoy it. So, and like I was saying, yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, and I'm open to questions. I honestly uh, love my job, and I, I literally will talk all day about it. So, yeah, if you guys have any questions, hit me up on Twitter. It's Weston Hecker at Twitter. So, and yeah, so I'll open up to questions, which I have like a minute left probably. So, <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys taking the time, and uh, like I said, um, if, feel free to like literally approach me. I, I, I know a lot of people say that, like I genuinely mean that. Like, hit me up on Twitter. I have a lot of criminals hit me up on Twitter too. So if you're wanting me to, you know, let's hijack a ship of Mercedes vehicles or something, I probably won't do it with you. But you know, if you guys want to learn some stuff, like definitely let me know. I, I love uh, chatting with people and learning and seeing enthusiasm. It makes me more enthusiastic because when you get burned out on something, it's really nice to be able to, you know, see people with passion. So, so I appreciate it, guys. And yeah, Weston Hecker at Twitter. Feel free to hit me up and I'll uh, get in contact with you. Otherwise, I'll be right outside here and we can chat also. So thank you, guys.